welcome to episode five of Point Me to Jesus. I am incredibly thrilled to have two of my lifelong friends, Dallas and Amanda Jenkins here with us. Uh, Dallas, I'm going to let you just give our audience a little purview of maybe our family's history together and we'll let Amanda interject. Well, I have actually known you, Tara, since I was in sixth grade and promised my brother that I would marry you someday. <laughs> um, you were, uh, I think at the time, I don't, I don't know uh, how much older than I, you are. Uh, we, we can, we don't need to talk about it, but, uh, but you were, you were in high school. I believe. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so I had read, my, my dad was getting to know your mother and your father uh, and, and were considering doing a book together at the time. They ended up writing a book together. And through that, we, that's how we met. So I've known you probably, I guess, over 30 years. Yeah. Um, Gosh, and so, yeah. That's crazy. So when I met Amanda and finally had made the decision to not marry you. Oh, um, <laughs> thank and, you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, Sorry, Gerald. Yes. <laughs> and uh, met Amanda in college. And uh, that's when you first met her. But you guys didn't, the two of you didn't start becoming BFFs until a little bit after that, when you started talking about potential book ideas uh, together. And uh, the two of you have actually written uh, two children's books now. Right. Um, but yeah, I think once I met Amanda and kind of introduced you to... Uh, I just I, took I kinda, the ball. Yeah. And I decided we were lifelong instead of you two being uh, like, right. <laughs> you and right. me, baby. Right. Well, when I tell you the age difference, I think it'll be very revealing <laughs> to Dallas. That I was, no, I think what Dallas was really attracted to, remember y'all, I was dating the quarterback of Wheaton College at the time. And so I really think it was Dallas's love affair with football that was the attraction. So he just got three tickets to the Wheaton football it was wooed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. But, you know, we have been friends for a long time. And, you know, in this world where there is such a transient friendship, it's wonderful to know that our families have connected like that. And now our yeah. children are friends. Our children, yeah. We're making memories yeah. together. Uh, Amanda, tell the audience that what happened to us last spring. Well, our kids connected and completely connected and then all of a sudden they were planning trips and so your kids came up and spent a week with us yep. and then the four oldest all decided to go to each other's proms and so yep. we came down to your prom and y'all came up to our prom and it, it was just been the sweetest thing because it gives us more reason to <laughs> get together and so they're all connected and we're all connected and they're always yeah. making plans so. and I hope that's an encouragement to Christian families you know when you really are just pursuing passionately a relationship with Jesus Christ and a past a passion for purity in your relationships you know I think mm -hmm. um, the three of us can attest to that you know we don't joke about dating and things but but we all um, had predetermined that we wanted um, our wedding nights to be a special night that it's supposed to be and that we um, set ourselves apart for that to honor God and our marriages and in our relationships and how the Lord brought Lee into my life and now Dallas you and Lee are becoming friends and I've never you know you you talk often about the failure that led you to the chosen but to me uh, it was really a springboard of success because Lee is hard to woo and when it comes to to movies he is an amazing critic he really is um, I often say he's missed his calling as an actor because he can leave the theater and have the entire script memorized it's, it's <laughs> bizarre but what if really instilled in him a confidence in Christian movie making and Aww. really endeared my husband's heart, Amanda, to your husband's heart uh, right. with his creativity, with his script writing, with his directing, with his detail. And mm. then when along comes uh, the resurrection of Gavin Stone, our family was just hooked. And, uh, you know, that movie to us is one that I'm praying and I've told, I know I've told both of you this before, I'm praying that the Lord will just really allow the chosen TV series to launch interest in some of your past things like the resurrection of Gavin Stone, which I think should be a must see among every Christian circle there is. So um, tell us a little bit, Dallas, about you know how you kind of looked at that story 
uh, as a as a setback, but um, in some of our eyes, it was um, it was you're moving from from success to success in my eyes. But tell a little bit about that background story. That's very kind. You were the one family that saw the resurrection of Gavin Stone <laughs> when, it, when it came out in theater. I rented out a theater for you. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, you rented out a theater for your family and about four other people. <laughs> so, uh, so that was lovely. No, um, the resurrection of Gavin Stone. Uh, was released to theaters in January of 2017. And I remember the date exactly. It was January 20th because mm. it was Inauguration Day. Yep. And it happened to be the day that in just a couple of hours, I went from being a director who had a very bright future to a director with no future. Because the events that led up to The Resurrection of Gavin Stone being released were extraordinary. I mean, I, I had done a short film for my church and that had gotten in the hands of some really significant Hollywood producers some of the top producers and studios in Hollywood were very passionate about making faith-based movies with me. And Resurrection of Gavin Stone was the first one that we did together. And it was a movie that had a very strong faith message. We've actually filmed it in my church in the Chicago area. And there was nothing that was compromised about it. I mean, you, you saw it. It, was, it had a very strong message, but yet was financed by Hollywood production companies. And so it was, it was in many ways the best of both worlds for me. And the movie had tested so well, and the prospects for the movie were so promising that they wanted to do future movies with me, and we were already planning on several movies over the next 10 years. And then when the movie came out in theaters uh, on that Friday, January 20th, within the first couple hours, the numbers came in, and it was clear that it was immediately that it was going to be a box office failure. Uh, the numbers were lower even than their lowest projections. And so I was home alone with Amanda that afternoon, and we were just so confused, and we were crying and so sad, yeah, yeah. praying. And uh, the first thing that we thought of was, well, it seemed like God had been so involved in this process leading to this point, but since it failed so spectacularly, <laughs> I guess He must not have been involved um, because we tend to believe God isn't the author of anything that can fail. And so I think our measurement of what success or failure is can sometimes um, confuse us as to whether or not God is involved in something. Sometimes you see something as successful, you assume God must have blessed it. You see something as failing, God must not have been part of it. And that's where we were. And in that moment uh, of disappointment, and I guess realizing that because these companies were now backing out of future projects, I was left with a really uncertain future at best. And in that moment, God met us there more than any other time, I think, in either of our lives, yeah. um, and certainly in our in our marriage, where um, he, especially through Amanda, I mean, I think God um, has a special, kind of gives special revelation to wives, sometimes even more than husbands, um, and and wives tend to be really clued in to sometimes, sometimes to what the Lord is, is saying, whereas husbands, sometimes we, we tend to just be so Driving. focused on driving ahead that we, we don't stop and listen as much as we should. And uh, God really spoke very clearly to Amanda, uh, gave her the story of the feeding of the 5,000, along with the phrase, I do impossible math. Just kind of was like pressing it. I, I clean when I'm upset. <laughs> so I was just busy mopping. And um, he just kept on pressing that story on my heart with that phrase that made no sense at the time. Yeah, and, and when you hear something from the Lord, uh, there are also times when you feel like you're hearing something from the Lord, and it's just your own mind, and then there's times when you think it's your own mind, and it's God giving you an impression. And uh, so we weren't sure, but she just said, that phrase, I do impossible math, yeah. is really coming hard uh, to my heart. And so when you read the story of the feeding of the 5,000, and you see how much Jesus was part of the hunger that led to the miracle. He wasn't just there for the solution. He was actually also part of the problem. I mean, it was in many ways, if you want to put it this way, it was his fault that the people were so hungry because he'd been talking for so long. And so none of it was a surprise to him. He, was, he had a direct hand in that hunger. And so we thought, oh, maybe God is telling us that he's leading us to this place where the only thing left is a miracle. And he's about to do impossible math and turn these box office numbers around magically, and we're going to have some <laughs> amazing story to tell. And that didn't happen. Uh, so we just thought, well, we'll see what God has in store, um, and we'll just try to learn what we can from it. And that night at 
four o'clock in the morning as I was typing out a 15 page memo, analyzing everything that had gone wrong and assigning myself a lot of blame and all that. Um, I was doing what I think a lot of leaders are supposed to do. You, you try to analyze what you went, what, what you did wrong so that you can prevent it from happening in the future. Right. And a Facebook message popped up on my screen from someone who I've never even met, just a Facebook friend that we've talked maybe once a year for a few years. Um, and it didn't say hi, didn't say hello, didn't say heard about your movie. It just said, remember, your job is not to feed the 5,000. It's only to provide the loaves and fish. And I thought for a second, honestly, that maybe our computer had been recording our conversation yeah. and that he had overheard it somehow yeah. because it was just so bizarre. And I just froze for a second. And then I said, what are you doing up at four in the morning? And he said, well, I'm in Romania. I'm on a different time zone. I'm with my brother. And I said, so before I respond to you, I just have to ask, like, why did you say that? And he said, oh, that wasn't me. God just led me to share that with you. And at that moment, I think my life transformed because not only did I truly understand that God was present and that he was seeing me in this time, but that concept is a life-altering concept. When you really truly can get to the place where you realize that your job is solely to provide the loaves and fish, however many they are, and that once God deems them worthy of acceptance, that's where the transaction ends. Yeah. You're not responsible for the outcome. Um, as someone who is controlling and someone who does feel responsible for uh, my success or failure, that was truly a life altering concept. Yeah. And we didn't still didn't know where it was going to end, but I truly got to the place where I was perfectly okay. If I never made another movie or if I never had another project, I was okay with that for the first time in my career, yeah. because I just wanted to be doing whatever God had in front of me. And I just wanted to make sure, and this will sound cheesy, but I wanted to make sure that I was just the best baker and the best fisherman that I could be. And I wasn't going to worry about everything else, which is why I was open-minded to doing a short film for my church's Christmas Eve service. Again, it was just about the birth of Christ and the perspective of the shepherds. It was done on my friend's farm here in Illinois. And it felt like a big step down from doing a motion picture with Hollywood production companies. Yeah. But I was just wanting to do whatever loaves and fishes that I could do. And I just wasn't going to worry about what that meant or where that led. Yeah. And uh, that was that was truly a, a tremendous place for us to to land was just to be willing to be used in whatever way we could. Oh, and I remember when Aunt Amanda sent me uh, before y'all even aired it at the church, and Lee and I again were just mesmerized by that as well. So just what the Lord has done through you. Do you feel like with the success of your dad, Dallas? You know, many of our viewers may not know that your dad is Jerry Jenkins, who uh, wrote. Uh, such a successful series, The Left Behind. You know, I can remember us, I mean, the three of us, y'all, I think it was the summer that Left Behind really hit number one. We were all together in Chicago. Yeah. And Amanda, I can remember Dallas uh, thinking about who was going to play which part. You know, I mean, yeah. his time from a little boy, and you were little, I was like, I was like 10 years older than you are. So, you know, I mean, not I can imagine true. Right? I was like, this, this child prodigy, I mean, it's just amazing back there, you know, already casting this um, particular role for this particular actor. Mm -hmm. And so your, your bent has always been towards sure. filmmaking and sharing the gospel um, on the, you know, the big cinema stage. And I've always respected that so much. I love how you give credit to your wife, though. And I wish that you had in the series. I keep looking at casting <laughs> by this other woman, and I'm like, that's not true. Amanda's the one <laughs> Yes. It is true. It is true. But it is love, true. We have I, a casting I, agent who's our official. I lead. know, but I know oh. who the, I know who the first screen is. But I love yeah. how y'all work so beautifully together. You know, I mean, that's such a testament to married couples. And and y'all know because I am kind of like the older sister. I am very protective of y'all's marriage. Yeah. I mean, you that know. I, I intercept, so I, I get involved in some conversations when I look like I'm a little too flirty there with some people that are, you know, following my friends, so oh. I'm, I'm going to raise my sisterly head. Um, you know, yeah, our fan, I, our fan club can get pretty uh, I, expressive I, I, sometimes. I'm, I'm monitoring, I'm I am monitoring. Uh, <laughs> you know, but I mean, you know, it was your dad that wrote in Hedges, um, big right. doors swing on small hinges, so, you know, yes. we have yep. to be guarded. So what are y'all doing? as a couple, as the success of The Chosen continues to grow, uh, how are y'all staying connected as a married couple? 
Well, it started with the continuation even of that story. I mean, we, we go through every uh, success or failure together. Yeah. And, um, you know, even just six to eight months later after I did that short film, that short film that I just did for my church ended up going, uh, you know, all over the internet and being the catalyst that led to us yeah. raising financing for The Chosen. And it was crowdfunded. And the all-time crowdfunding record had been $5.7 million from other projects that had huge fan bases. And I was starting from scratch with no fan base and coming off of a career disappointment. And I remember when we were sitting at the computer and the number passed $10 million for crowdfunding, which shattered the all-time crowdfunding record. About, and it was all for a show about Jesus that started from scratch. Amanda looked at me and tears in her eyes and said, I do impossible math. And it was like yeah. God was pressing on her heart as clearly as he had the first time that that's what he meant by that. And that phrase has followed us through this whole process. And so to answer your question, we keep each other, I think, accountable. And we have over the last two years to never lose sight of that principle, yeah. that principle of not your job to feed the 5,000, only to provide the loaves and fish. So the success of this project, we don't assign um, uh, the, the value or the, um, the, the reasoning to ourselves. Um, we've often said there's no amount of success this project could have that could make me believe I'm responsible for it. Yeah. So whether it's successful or not, and The Chosen has proven the last few months to be way more successful than we anticipated, yeah. way more successful than we're capable of, that's on us to keep each other accountable to go, just remember what got us here. And it wasn't it wasn't the skill in filmmaking. It wasn't even some of the the uh, impressions and uh, leaning in to that that she got from the Lord, um, specifically at those times that were directly responsible for it. It was just this humble posture that we've been trying to adopt, yeah. and it, genuinely speaking. And um, I think being involved together in the process, um, yeah. like you said, she does she does have a big hand in casting. Um, yeah. she, she because she does have such great intuition. So yeah. even just from something as practical as that to just simply going, are we on track with what got us here in the first place, yeah. which was genuine humility and brokenness? Yeah. Um, and are we gonna maintain that posture no matter what happens with this show, positive or negative? Right. And that's, I think, the most important thing. Yeah, and, and too, in just a practical sense, there's, um, we spend a lot of time talking about the show because we're both really passionate about that, but we also spend um, time, almost, almost every night, we are, kids are in bed and we are, hanging out, not doing the show. So just from a purely marriage standpoint, I think we, it was instilled in us from an early age that time um, is super valuable. And, and he goes, he has to go and leave the kids and um, me to do this show. And, and I've, I've begun to really understand that phrase, um, a sacrifice of praise. So um, that I have to remind myself of that and not be a martyr and let him go. But then when he comes back, he's got to really come back. And we're just, we really make sure that we get that time in that um, we're passionate about this project and we do this thing together. Um, but then we also do just life together and normal, fun life married things. In terms of your daily accountability to Christ, um, what, who would you say, Amanda, is, your hero of the faith from the Bible. Uh, I know you get into God's Word daily. I mean, you and I are kind of accountability partners at times for that time in God's Word. Mm -hmm. So if you could just pick one person um, from the Bible, who, who would you say is yours? And Dallas, you can think on it because that's your question next to yeah, I would my first instinct at this point, I think from where the Lord has had me for the last two, three years is Moses, which I know I'm supposed to probably say a girl, but um, just what was required of him and, and to, to go into the complete unknown and let God be the map, yeah. um, and the daily provider. I feel like that's the track he's had us on. And so I've, I've just been entrenched in, um, Moses's walk for about three years now. And, um, I love his, um, his victories and his failings. And was it, was it season, what, I mean, was it episode three or four? I can't remember where you did the flashback um, with the snake on, um, uh, with the, the bronze serpent. You know, you've done such a yeah. great yeah. job. And when I say you, y'all are a team. So y'all are, but intertwining, because we know that Jesus is in, from Genesis to Revelation, he's in every book of the Bible. And that's one thing that I, that has endeared me to the chosen is 
you have become such a great Bible teacher. You've taken our flannel pictures off, <laughs> off the flannel board and, and just breathed life into them in such a special way and such with the personalities and the uniqueness, but how you've tied in the Old Testament truths with the New Testament truths. And I've loved that. I, I really, really loved that. So Dallas, what about you? Your, your hero of the faith from the Bible. Well, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, my favorite verse is Psalm 34, 5, which is those who look to him are radiant, their faces are, shall not be ashamed. That was written by David. Um, it's hard to choose David as a hero of the faith because of some of the awful things that he did, but it also is a healthy reminder of, of what we're capable of, even, yeah. though, even though David was a man after God's own heart, he was capable of pretty awful things. And so it's, it's a healthy reminder for us to, 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 to stay on that yeah. fat stay on that path and to keep our faces turned to him yeah. i think there's a reason why he says it's radiant when you're looking at him mm -hmm. and there's no shame but when you're turning away from him or trying to hide your face from his it's typically because of shame yeah. but there's a yeah. there, there's a, a a person in in the new testament um who has always been kind of an unsung hero for me and that's uh, ananias who put the the mud on on uh, saul's eyes um be, you know when he was when he had just been blinded um yeah by by uh by by his appear by his appearance by Je well, <laughs> by god by jesus and i got you the, the road to damascus um <laughs> and uh helped restore paul's sight yeah. and uh just that he's he's doesn't there's not a lot said about him in the, in the new testament but that moment of just being willing to listen to god and just be the guy who provides the assist that leads mm -hmm. to this amazing ministry um, the, probably the most second to Christ, the most in, impactful ministry in the history of the world, um, was just always someone um, that I, you know, seeing Ananias as someone who removed the, or at least allowed God to remove the scales from Paul's eyes, I kind of see a little bit, um, that's what I'm trying to do in yeah. my storytelling, is, is an attempt to remove the scales from people's eyes to see Jesus more clearly. Yeah. And that's what I think The Chosen has been. So Ananias has always been, in fact, I almost named our film company Ananias but I figured people would have a hard time pronouncing it. So we just went with, <laughs> with Jenkins. Uh, I, love, I mean, I love that because his courage, I mean, just his holy boldness to just do exactly what he was called to do um, to, you know, the worst religious terrorist at the time that mm -hmm. <laughs> had ever lived. So, I mean, and, and that was a whole, super good answer. <laughs> I like that he answer. Gave, I mean, he I actually, actually kind of got it wrong because I don't think he put mud on his eyes. I don't know about the mud, but yeah, I think he, that was Jesus who did him. it. But, but he did, he did, You're he did allow the scales. Too, yeah. So. yeah, no, that, but I mean, just the fact that, yeah, I mean, it, and, and y'all both are, I mean, you are in brave new waters. And, and I have to point this out because you know, I've been praying and you know, Lee and I are an investor. We're, we're investors in the show from when we may have been number three after your parents. Yeah, you were, <laughs> you were early adopters. You were early. But, um, you know, we've been praying for our little brother and sister for years and uh, in all aspects. I mean, y'all, we've prayed each other through babies and adoptions and um, cancer and, and all sorts of things. That, and more babies. And more babies and more books <laughs> and all sorts of things. But yeah. um, you know what I just, I love to see see about y'all again about your relationship and the beauty of how the Lord's knitted your hearts together with this project I cannot watch Peter's wife without you know thinking of Amanda sometimes <laughs> that's, that's not a coincidence uh, <laughs> we we've had several people say uh Simon Peter's wife Eden um what's you know what where, 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 what where, where'd you get all that you know that kind of spitfire intensity <laughs> but fun, yeah but, but rooted in love. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, um, I, see it. I but, see it every time. I rewind. Right. I'm like, I've, I've seen that before. Yeah. yeah. But I think that that's actually what, um, what is often has been lacking in a lot of Bible projects in the past. I've grown up and seen pretty much all the Jesus movies and miniseries that have been made. And one of the things that I think is often lacking is that human um, authenticity, that relatability, yeah. um, the, the characters oftentimes feel like one or two dimensional and you don't feel like you can really connect with them or relate with them. And that's because we sometimes uh, treat them with such reverence, which is, which can be a good thing, but we treat them with such reverence that we miss out on the humanity. And so when I was writing some of those scenes and using some of the things that I've experienced in my own life and some of the things that I think are common to a lot of marriages, when people see Simon Peter and Eden um, having both an argument and having a romantic moment. Um, it's to say, oh wow, uh, you know, I've never seen a 
marriage, a marital argument in a Bible show right. before. And then I remember when I was filming the scene, I thought, I've never even seen a marriage portrayed in a yeah. Bible show before. Yeah. And I think that really has a conscious and subconscious effect on the viewer right. where, you, where you go, huh, if they're like me and they're experiencing the same struggles or even some of the same victories as I am, perhaps the answer in their life can be the same for me as it was for them, which is mm -hmm. the, the hope that only the Messiah can provide. Yeah. So next date night, when all four of us are together, I can't wait for you just to kind of imagine what Job and his wife went through together. <laughs> That's how you would picture that scene. But uh, back to the show. Um, what would you say, Amanda, so far has been your favorite um, shot, shoot, scene, uh, episode? Because there are so many, and I want the viewers I mean, really, you've just got to see all eight episodes, and I cannot wait for season two. But um, there's so much richness in each one. I mean, I could watch one take something. I mean, it's almost like when I read God's Word, I can read the same verse a million times, and every time, because it's living and active, I get something new from it, you know? Yeah. And I kind of feel like that's how the Lord has anointed this show, because you can watch one episode and take away one thing, and then you watch it again, and you take away something completely different. Yeah. So what would you say, um, one that just stands out to you that was just like, wow. Well, my favorite episode is seven. Um, the culmination of Matthew um, coming to Jesus and, and Nicodemus almost, but not coming to Jesus. And um, I just see so many different people that I know and love in those two people yeah. and it's so wrapped up in um hope but also um you know some tragedy and um just to ultimately see jesus's heart for um different personalities and different um people who are at different stages in their yeah. um in their journey toward him or away from him it just that one just gets me and the music is incredible in that the one and um yeah. yeah so that's that's my favorite and i think that is the moses one uh, yeah, yeah so it starts with Moses. So it's like, for me, yeah. it's all, well, it's all there. And what you're speaking to is, and I think the last 10 minutes of episode seven is what she's referring to. And I think that's, pro pro you know, pro probably the best 10 minutes of, of, of season one. Um, and it's set, th th I think the reason that we get impacted by it is because there's setup. And that's something that you don't often see right. um, yeah. when, when you've got several episodes to set up their storyline and to, explain what could have gotten Nicodemus to that place where he believed Jesus was the Messiah and the son of God, but wasn't fully ready to follow him publicly, to acknowledge him publicly, um, which isn't explicitly said in scripture, but it's certainly clear that he met with him under cover of darkness. Um, and then the next time we see Nicodemus, he's making kind of a half-hearted, subtle defense of Jesus in his uh, when he's on trial, he's not publicly a supporter or a follower of Jesus. Yeah. And so we took the time to develop what could have led to that point, including uh, at the beginning of episode seven, we do a flashback to Moses when yeah. Moses puts the bronze serpent on yeah. the pole, because that's referenced yeah. in John chapter three. Yeah. Yeah. So those kinds of things, I think, um, are, they, they seem obvious when you when you see it now. Um, but those are the kinds of things that we're trying to do that I think allow you to feel like when you watch one episode once, you get something, you get one thing, and then you watch it again, you get something different. And uh, that's, that's something that I can't really take responsibility for. Uh, a lot of the moments that people say were really inspiring to them, I actually respond by saying, yeah, it was really inspiring to me yeah, too I, when, it, when it came. I'll speak to that because they do these writing summits where our team of writers get together and they spend days mapping out and figuring out what the sequence of events is going to be. And they have papers strewn all over my house and where they're writing things and following yeah. these trails. And I'll come in and out of that and see what they're doing. And it never, I mean, it's not like brilliant. I mean, it's just like if they're plotting things yeah. and then, but they're, they're prayerful and they're, they're listening and they're, um, the Lord is just in it. And then what emerges, just oh, what rises to the surface. Just, just great the stuff. Of it. I mean, even in, I think maybe episode five or three, when, uh, you know, um, Peter's boat lands on the shore and Jesus is teaching Episode and, four, um, yeah. Is that four? Okay. And so and he <laughs> turns around and he says, you know, cast your net. And you know, Peter said, hey, yeah, right. I've done this all day. And, uh, but I'll take you at your word. You know, I mean, just the subtlety. Yeah, I'm just going to, I'm just going to believe you. And then that's what we're called to do is take him at his word. And you've got so many that are trying to 
read gray into what is explicitly black and white in scripture. And you've done such a great job uh, as one, as y'all know, I mean, I am one that exhorts truth and um, I'm a firm believer in non-compromise. Amanda's laughing because because I know, because it's so you know, true. <laughs> you know who you're talking to, but I love the way Even when it's not asked for. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> you're handling truth in such an incredibly great way, and I'm so proud of y'all for that. So Dallas, what's been your favorite uh, scene to shoot? Oh, um, well, I think oftentimes what is the favorite scene to shoot is different maybe than the, your favorite scene when it's all completed. Yeah. Um, I really did enjoy... Uh, the scenes that took place on the water um, because they were so challenging. Yeah. Uh, so in episode four, where you see Simon out on the boat in the middle of the night and he's desperate and he can't catch a fish and he's in debt and he's oppressed and he's got marital issues yeah. and he's at his lowest point and he just starts yelling at God um, and, and expressing himself in a genuine, authentic way. And I think um, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, it's it's hard to watch, and 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 uh, it's hard to imagine some of our heroes of the faith having those kinds of moments. But I think that they did. We certainly know David did constantly, yeah. and so Simon kind of taking the audience through the history of of the Jewish people, and and laying it all out there, and going, you know what? It doesn't actually feel like we're very chosen here. Yeah. Um, it feels like we're goats being yanked around, yeah. and uh, not at all like we're chosen. Yeah. And then, right as he's saying that. And he's saying, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not chosen. I'm just being yanked around. His friends and his brother show up to help him. Yeah. And of course, the next morning when, when Andrew is saying, I want to tell you about the lamb of God. And Simon says, well, I don't need a lamb. I need fish. Yeah. And just how, um, how much he didn't know exactly what he was saying, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and even said it to Eden uh, earlier that the, the day before where he said, faith isn't going to get me more fish. Yeah. And um, he, he was, he had his eye only on the temporary and he wasn't seeing the meaning and the symbolism of what was happening and what was about to happen. And so filming that and, um, those moments when you're, it's just you and one other actor and they're really exploring, uh, the depth of humanity, which is not just not something that I've, I've really seen much in Jesus projects, which is why I wanted to do it this way. Those were always really, uh, really fun to shoot. Talk about, talk about Matthew. Yeah, uh, Matthew, I think other than Jesus, is probably our most talked about character from the show because we portray him as being on the autism spectrum. Yeah. And um, I remember when we were having our writing retreat, uh, when we were first plotting out, this was back in like around Thanksgiving of 2017, yeah. when we were starting to think about what uh, a full season could look like. And we are picking our main characters from the Bible. Who are we going to focus on? And we, we thought Matthew's story was interesting because Jesus walks past him and just says, follow me. And Matthew just drops everything and follows him. And he's a tax collector. Yeah. And tax collectors were looked at like prostitutes back then. I mean, they were the worst of the worst in the minds of the Jewish people. So we thought, okay, that's going to be a really interesting thing to explore. Well, as we started mapping out his character qualities that we could pick up on from the Gospels, and, and what, what, what do we know about Matthew? Well, he's a numbers guy because he's a tax collector. He's a facts guy. I mean, the first chapter of his book is nothing but a genealogy, and it's split into three sections of 14. Details. So he's a details facts guy. And he also chose a profession that made him a social outcast. Yeah. And as we're writing all that out, and I'm going, huh, well, I have a daughter on the autism spectrum, and uh, Amanda and I have done a lot of work in the special needs community and spent a lot this of time in very that. very familiar. And I'm like... <laughs> That's someone who, you know, I said, what if we actually wrote him as being on the spectrum? That's never been done before in a Bible show. <laughs> and think of how interesting that could be for the viewer, even if you're not on the spectrum, to see that. And, and I think it kind of humanizes the, the, these people that you haven't really humanized before. And then also <laughs> watching um, a person that, uh, if you are on the spectrum or if you're a parent of someone on the spectrum, seeing, seeing yourself accurately portrayed, I think uh, is is a unique opportunity that isn't often uh, allowed for these types of projects. Portrayed accurately in your weaknesses and your strengths and then called. Yes. You know, I think that's what um, is so sweet about it for a lot of people. And we have had actually a lot of people in the special needs community um, say, I've never seen myself on uh, camera or on film. And then to be 
uniquely chosen, called, pursued um, by Jesus as the savior. It's, it's over. I mean, it's overwhelming to us um, because of our experience, but then just to hear people say that has been a really cool thing. Let me tell you a story. Do you think that impossible things can happen? Miracles. I can never forget what I saw. I'm so sorry, I, I, I don't actually know your name. I'm Jesus. Are you dangerous? Maybe to some. I saw him. It was incredible. I need to know if we have a problem. The man claimed to be God. False prophecy. Again, I ask you, is there a problem? The so-called miracle worker? Jesus of Nazareth. Apparently something good can come from Nazareth. <laughs> Like a stone in the water, watch the mud rise up. If we are going to have a question and answer session, every time we do something you're not used to, it's going to be a very annoying time together for all of us. Should have known we'd bring trouble, trouble gonna find you here. There are righteous men on the lookout for you, and they are weighing every word you say. Trouble. This is different. Get used to different. We didn't choose him. He chose us. I see you. Oh, I really don't like that man. Follow me and you'll see more. There was one way and now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. And so it's time. Let's go. Uh, tell us a little bit how we can watch The Chosen. Um, I know I've gifted several friends um, who have had a little bit of trouble with the uh, app understanding. Uh, the DVDs, I think, are a great gift. Just pop them in and watch it uh, whenever you want. So can y'all just talk to that and also the merchandise. I'll try to put uh, a link to where people can go. I can't wait. I'm gifting those to Caroline and Daniel as we take them to college. So they're going to all be <laughs> binging Jesus t-shirts and, and represent. caps and we're representing. Yes, big time. <laughs> so, and even the gators. I've got to give them a gator too. Yeah, we've got the, we've got the chosen mask yeah. and gators because uh, uh, sometimes you just have, you know, you have to wear the mask even if you don't want to. So yeah. you might as well be supporting yeah, or promoting something <laughs> positive. But um, one of the things I want to mention too that we, did, we didn't talk about earlier that Amanda and I did do together, this is the yeah. chosen devotional book, yeah. which Amanda and her writing partner, Kristen, did the bulk of the work on. Um, but this is the book that um, takes you even deeper into the stories of the Gospels, yeah. into the people of the Gospels. And it's and a 40-day it, journey too. Yeah, 40 days. 40, 40 day devotional, and yeah. it's a companion piece to the show, but also could exist even if the show didn't. And it's been really cool to see it become a bestseller on Amazon. It's available on Amazon. It's available on, uh, on our app and, and our store. Um, and you can, um, it, we've really tried to make every single item, whether it's a devotional book or even a t-shirt or a hat, not just something that's promoting the show. Yes. Uh, it, we we want to spur conversation. Uh, yeah. We want it to be something that A, you're actually going to want to wear. Mm -hmm. So we make it as high quality as possible, but B, something, whether it's our binge Jesus or we have the phrase, get used to different, which is one of the key phrases of season one when Jesus says that to Simon Peter, um, or our, even our logo, which is, uh, you know, teal fish, 13 teal fish would represent love, Jesus yes, the I love that. Swimming, swimming against the current of all the other gray fish, yes. um, which we're trying to also make a statement about that is that we want to be swimming against the current as much as possible. So um, yeah, the DVDs you can get if you're not someone who wants to watch it on an app, which is how the primary, which is the primary means to watch it. So the cool thing about the app is if you go to the app store on your phone or go to Google Play, if you've got an Android, you can just look up for the chosen. We're easy to find. Download it to your phone. It's free. It's easy. It takes 20 seconds. And here's the cool thing. If you don't want to watch it on your phone, totally fine. I don't want to watch it on my phone either. But VidAngel, our distribution partner, literally created technology that allows you to connect it directly to your streaming device with no subscription, no purchase or anything. So if you've got a Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, Chromecast, HDMI cable, 
you can connect directly to your streaming device and watch it in full quality, totally free, no subscription required, no questions asked, no, nothing you have to fill out. So you can be watching the show on your television yeah. if you've got a simple, cheap streaming device within 90 seconds of downloading the app. And that's how most people are watching all the episodes. So that's been the coolest thing. The app has been um, just, I mean, it's in every country in the world now. It's been translated in over 50 languages and yeah. counting. Um, God is doing some unbelievable things with this thing, and the word just continues to spread about it. It's been a great ride to yeah, be Y'all on. hit one million followers on Facebook yesterday, and uh, so by the time <laughs> this airs next week, uh, prayerfully, we'll have two million. That'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> that would truly be impossible math. <laughs> I'm going to put y'all on the spot, um, because that's what big sisters do. Oh, okay? fantastic. So, uh, y'all are amazing vocalists, both of you. So no, <laughs> just a little something, just a little something for our viewers. I mean, y'all, the hymns, the music of the show is fantastic, by the way. I absolutely love the music. Uh, I do. I cannot wait for the viewers. If you've not seen, you've got to just notice the, uh, the what do you call it, Dallas, the intro to the show? What's the... The opening credits, where the opening credits song, yeah, is also kind of, a, it's, a, it's an original song just for the show. But it's just not that song. I'm talking about the visuals with the yeah. fish, because I mean, that's, yeah. just, that's just awesome. Mm -hmm. count them. You see Jesus and the 12, and the, and the fish representing, and just how they turn, that is just so cool. I just love the symbolism in that. So, right. one well, I'll sing, what, what I can, well, what I'll do, I will sing the jingle for our website, <laughs> because <laughs> we started doing that on our that's live not stream. Fair. <laughs> and, and then you can just sing the phrase, walk on the water from the opening song. Just one phrase. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll Amanda sing one for it. Which is Amanda comes from like a singing family, and she yes, I do, and I and I and I'm happy to do that in certain contexts. <laughs> but what, what I'll do really quickly is, if you are interested in getting any of the t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats or COVID, uh, you know, COVID masks with the chosen, you just go to www.thechosenmerch.com. <laughs> So, so chosenmerch.com, uh, I just sing that little jingle, but all, I, I thought, keep it simple, because I know you don't want to sing a whole song or anything like that on a podcast, but that opening song from the, the opening credits, you could just sing one phrase from it, right? Are there phrases? She's just yeah. rolling all over the place. Or a hymn, or y'all sing together all the time. Hamilton, gracious, we visit, we toured the Yorktown yes, we did that together. <laughs> yes, but I don't remember I felt like Dallas was doing like a Pre, um, uh, what a preset screening that day. <laughs> we go to we we go to Yorktown, guys, and we're listening to the historical DVD mm -hmm. telling where all the battles are, and it's fabulous. I love history, but I can only imagine what was going through Dallas's mind <laughs> <laughs> after y'all had driven like fifteen plus hours anyway. So I know I had prepped him for it. Okay, so Hamilton, okay. Right. a connection to. God in the show. How does that go? Um, Washington. Um, Everybody will live under his own vine, fig tree, and no one will make him afraid. Yeah. Right? Everyone will live under his own vine, fig tree, which is something that we cover in season two. Little spoiler alert. Oh, look at that. I which, know. Is the, which is the calling of Nathaniel. And how did Nathaniel know that Jesus was the Messiah? He identified him as in he said, I have. Uh, I saw you when you were under the fig tree, which is which has multiple meetings, but meanings, but it's a symbolism from the Old Testament, and uh, and uh, yeah, that's a lyric Yay. from, well, that from was Hamilton. Just, that was perfect. Oh. I was see the Lord just. I mean, He's in the yes. details. He's in the details in every detail. I just love y'all so much. Thank you for your time. Love Thank you. you. Love you. And family, you know. I mean, just think, Dallas, how the Lord put your dad in charge of writing my mom's book, Commitment to Love, and like. 1987, 88 or something, and just how the Lord has knitted now multi-generations. Yeah. What is that verse about, you know, his faithfulness to thousands of generations, and we're a part of that, so I'm just I'm so grateful. That, yeah. I love y'all dearly. All right, thanks. Love Everybody you. watch The Chosen TV. You will be blessed, and make sure you are wearing your chosen merchandise, mm -hmm. your hats, your, where's your hat? Amanda? 
Well, that's, this is a hat that's actually not been released yet. But. I cannot wait. When's it coming? Because you know I love baseball caps. So that's like, that, that's Look, my signature. That's going to be my signature piece right this there. This is the trucker that's hat not, that I forced him to make. So. I love it. Absolutely <laughs> love it. Cannot wait. Love you guys. Love, love you. All. all right.